so let's jump into the final message of this family series, this getting there series with a question. What's the most valuable or important thing that you lose on a regular basis? For you, maybe it's your glasses or your wallet or your car keys. Losing your car keys is like one of the worst things because when do you lose them? You lose them when you're trying to leave the house. That's when you realize it. When you're, you know, you're headed to the garage or you're already in the car and you realize you don't have your keys and inevitably you're running late for something. And so you, you run back in the house, you, you realize a couple things. First, you have no idea where your keys are. And, and second of all, you, you know, just like, you're checking your pockets. Do I have them on me? Do I still have them? And, and you're just lost. Anybody with me? You've, you've been there. You lose those keys and you're just stuck. How do you feel in that moment, right? Well, then how do you feel the moment that you find your keys? You're like, you know, throwing a party. You're dancing. You're, you're overwhelmed with relief because you're like, I can make my thing. I'm going to be there. There's this incredible peace that comes over you. This, this burden is lifted off your shoulders, Hold those emotions with you for a moment because I think they're a beautiful illustration defining a critical area idea today in our final message uh, of this series on family. I wanna talk to you about the power of lostness. And yes, I looked it up, that is actually a word. Uh, Lostness is the state of being lost and having a proper understanding of the power of lostness is critical to diving into our final topic in this Getting There series, the ability to resolve family hurt. So turn with me to Luke chapter 15, if you will. Uh, If you're using one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 627. If you didn't bring your Bible, you can raise your hand. The ushers are coming around. They'd love to hand you one. You can follow along. If you don't own a Bible, please raise your hand. Uh, We'd love to give you this Bible. Uh, Luke chapter 15. The stories we're going to look at today, which are known as parables in Scripture, are part of one of the most preached on passages in the Bible. So it's highly likely uh, if you've gone to church, you know, quite a few times that you've You've heard a message or messages on parts of this passage or all of this passage. I want to read the first two verses here to kind of set us up for our story and to give us context as to why Jesus even shared these parables. So Luke 15, starting with verse 1. It said, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. And the key phrase there is associating with sinful people. So the religious leaders of the day put people into two categories, those who were clean like them and everyone else. And they thought the greatest way to honor God was to avoid at all cost anyone who was unclean, even to the point where they would not teach unclean people God's word. To the Pharisees, some people were just not worth finding. And in response... Jesus shared three stories with everyone. The first two were really about setting up the the last one, the most famous one that we'll get to in a little bit. That third story is our focus for today, but we need to set it up. So let's jump in verse three. It says, so Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he'll call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. Now jump down to verse eight. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. Now, to be honest, at first glance, it doesn't, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Like if you have 99 sheep, why are you so worried about the one that you'll risk the 99? If you have nine coins, why are you worried about losing just the one? But that's not God's way of looking at this idea of lostness. So let me illustrate this idea with a story from my life, a recent story. Uh, I recently chaperoned uh, our son Truett's choir trip, his senior choir trip to Los Angeles. And as a chaperone, one of our jobs was to keep track of the kids. And as it turns out, all of them. We had to keep track of all of them, okay? And so there were 45 kids and five adults. And every time we got on the bus, 
And every time we gathered in the hotel lobby and every time we got ready to leave one location and move to another location, we would literally number off out loud. One, two, three. I was number 49, in case anybody cares. Uh, We would number off, and if one kid was missing, if one kid was missing, and I gotta tell you, it was always the same kid, right? But when that kid was missing, when he was missing, no one was thinking, well... 44 kids is close enough. Like, we're fine. No, when that one kid was missing, what would we do? We would all get on the bus while some of the adults went to locate that one kid. We'd do whatever it took to find that one kid. Why? Because every kid on the trip mattered. Every single one. Why is that? Because the lost always deserve to be found. The lost always deserve to be found. The value Jesus is drawing attention to in these two stories is the power of lostness and the power of being found. In fact, both in the story of the coin and of the sheep, Jesus ends with the same type of proclamation or celebration. If you look at verse seven, he says, in the same way there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. And then in verse 10, in the same way there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. In both of these, God is describing the power of the lost being found. There is joy in heaven over the lost being found. And that sets us up for the primary story in the text. And with these two stories, he was drawing the religious leaders into the idea that everyone deserves to be found. But the thing is, the sheep and the coin hadn't necessarily done anything wrong. The, the sheep, you know, the, the coin being lost wasn't the coin's fault. The sheep wasn't bad per se, it just kind of wandered off. Neither had done something to make it less valuable. But when we get to the third story, Jesus is actually telling a story that would have been a familiar parable to everyone, but he surprises them with a much different ending than they were used to. Verse 11. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them a story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of the estate now before you die. And the Pharisees would have been like, oh, oh, yeah, 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 I know this one. This is where the, fa- the father slaps the son and calls him out in his sin. I, I, but I wonder what that has to do with those first two stories about the the sheep and about the coin. And so imagine their surprise when Jesus continues in verse 12. The younger son told his father, I want my share of the state now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. The religious leaders at this point would have been dumbfounded because Jewish law specifically spoke to inheritance issues, how sons were not allowed to receive their inheritance early, okay? Okay. Sons were not allowed to get that inheritance early. And by demanding his inheritance early from his father, the younger son is placing no value on the life of the father. He's essentially saying, I don't care about you. I don't care about your life. I don't care about dishonoring our family name. I don't care about keeping the family business going. I don't care about any of that. I just want what's mine now. You can die for all I care. And not only does he disgrace his family by asking He disgraces them even more with what he does next. Verse 13, a few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. Now, there are actually multiple tragedies here. One is clear for us to see he wasted all his money. No parent wants that for their kids. We want them to be wise, to be good stewards, to be able to support themselves. But the moving away doesn't seem like that big of a problem to us in our culture because our culture celebrates when our kids move away or at least maybe not when they move away, but when they move out. Like when they go, you just be in the the empty nest and and they move out and they gain their independence. We celebrate them gaining that independence and being able to, to live on their own. The society that we're reading about at this time was a communal culture where generations did not move away. They stayed They took over the family business. They built a house next door. They cared for for their aging parents. No one left. That's not what you did. You didn't leave. In his leaving, the son was turning his back on his heritage. He was disgracing his family by the very act of leaving. Far country actually is symbolic of being outside of God's cover, okay? The level of family turmoil this would have caused would have been astronomical. He devalued his dad's life. He undid their their future and he left. 
And this kid doesn't deserve to be found. He deserves to be forgotten. Listen, most of us have heard this story many times, and in some ways we're too familiar with this parable. So much so that we have a skewed perspective when we hear it. We've always called this parable the parable of what? The prodigal son. And right off the bat, that causes us, even that name causes us to approach this parable a certain way and to see the characters in the story in the certain light. So we read the story as if it's about the younger son. But this parable has three characters and every one of them matter. This is a story about a dysfunctional family. It's the parable of the dysfunctional family. A family that, if we're honest, probably reminds us a little bit of ours. Every family has a certain amount of dysfunction in it, as we've been talking about. And for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, there's probably nothing more painful than family problems, particularly when our kids don't choose to follow in our footsteps of faith. Or when they choose their own path, when they cut family out of the picture. You know, you spend your life pouring into your children and, and, and trying to raise them right. And you, you, do, you make a lot of mistakes along the way, but you do your best. And when your child chooses to follow their own path, there's little else that can make a parent feel like more of a failure than that. And some parents in the room are carrying that burden right now. You're living in that pain daily. I know that's true, and statistics would bear it out. And there's a generation choosing to walk away from church and brokenhearted parents behind each young person who's choosing to go their own way in life. And often we read the story and we make the prodigal the bad guy. He's the one who chose to run off. He's the one who's living a sinful life. He's the one who turned his back on the father. And that's the perspective of the Pharisees hearing this story. And what Jesus is trying to help them understand, trying to help us understand, is the true condition of the prodigal son. Prodigal isn't defined specifically as being sinful, although the implication is that he was making sinful choices. Prodigal is defined as being extravagant and wasteful. Jesus is trying to change their perspective of the prodigal. And if you've got someone in your life, in your family, who's prodigal, Jesus wants you to not lose sight of this as well. Listen, the story of the prodigal son is not a story about sin. It's a story about lostness. It's not a story condemning the prodigal as bad or as unforgivable. It's a story following a wayward son as he wanders. And this makes the first two parables so important. Jesus starts starts with two stories that are crystal clear. The lost always deserve to be found. And only after telling those stories does he tell the story of a dysfunctional family with a son who is clearly lost. Now, I don't know what your family story is. I don't know how lost the prodigals in your life are, whether you're, they're your kids or your, your you know, sister's kids, your brother's kids, your, your niece's nephews, or maybe they're just friends or coworkers or whatever. I don't know what your story is. I do know this. I do know that no one's too lost for Jesus. So let's follow the son on his journey. Verse 14. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. So the picture that's being painted here is a picture of hitting rock bottom. See, often as parents, we actually try to protect our kids from consequences because we want them to avoid the pain we went through in our lives. And yet I think what we often tend to forget is that the pain we went through, God was actually doing a forming work, shaping us and molding us and growing us. And often as parents, we're actually guilty of protecting our kids from the things that actually would have helped them grow and mature. Now, certainly a lot of people, you know, uh, got no protection from their families. Your parents were not there for you. They did not help you. But, but I would say quite a bit more and more, there are parents who have overprotected their kids. Their kids can't deal with consequence. And they've actually hindered their ability to navigate mistakes. I don't know if that was the case for this young man, but what I do know, and in these moments, he was feeling the weight of his choices. While the family, uh, while the famine rather, wasn't his fault, His starvation during the famine was his fault. He knew in that moment that he had wasted all his money. He knew in that moment the famine had strapped everyone else financially, leaving no one else willing or able to help him in his situation. 
The only job he could find was working with pigs, and according to Jewish kosher laws, pigs were unclean animals, so normally a Jew wouldn't even go near a pig, and here he is caring for them, and he's so desperate for food, he's jealous of what they're eating, and it says no one gave him anything. Some scholars think the implication here is that he may have stolen food to stay alive. And that's when the light bulb finally went on. Verse 17. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. Now, this should be, and I believe is, the prayer of every parent of a prodigal. Hardship has a wonderful way of causing us to face the facts. The prodigal couldn't see how good the love of the father was until he experienced life outside of the father's cover. Realizing even his father's servants were living better than he was living. Realizing the lostness of his own condition. This lost child decides it's time to go home to the father. And in the passage, it says he came to his senses. And the implication is that he had sort of lost his mind. And in his years of being prodigal, he wasn't even in his right mind. But what he realized in this moment is that the, while prodigal was how he was living, it was not his identity. His identity was in his sonship. He recognizes himself as a sinner against God and against his family, and he expresses sorrow for what he's lost. But for what he knows, not just for what he's lost, but for what he knows he's done, for the hurt he knows he's caused. And though it took incredible courage on his part, he made the decision and he returned home to his father. Now here, parents, listen to me. Parents, we have to pause for a moment. You need to hear this. This message is about resolving family hurt. And when it comes to this, while we cannot control our kids, there is a huge part of us that we have to play in resolving family hurt. And we're gonna talk about that in, in just a moment here. But first, I want, one, I want you to understand one of the critical things that you need to see here in the story. Maybe our greatest responsibility as parents is this. The son could only choose to go home because he knew that the father was safe. One of the greatest roles as parents is to be safe for our kids. How much harder for them to know the heavenly father is safe if they don't find safety in their earthly family? How could they ever know the grace of the Heavenly Father if they don't see that grace from their own parents? We're gonna unpack that more in a moment, but first, uh, I need to take a moment to show you something critical. Go back to verse 11 with me for a moment. It says this, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. Again, this is a story about a dysfunctional family the younger son is a picture of rebellion and wandering and his heart's desires are obvious. His lostness is obvious. But listen, when he returns, the father lavishes love on him. Verse 20, so he returned home to his... Embraced him and kissed him. This son's lostness is obvious. The other lost son is not so easy to spot. See, the elder brother liked it at home, but make no mistake, he isn't any more loyal to the father than the first son. Both are driven most by what they wanted and both demanded their fair share from their father. When the elder brother, or when the younger brother returns home and, or, and, and he's home and the father's welcome, the elder brother comes in from the fields and he hears the sound of a party and he finds out his younger, younger brother has returned and he's furious. That younger brother had already taken his share of the inheritance, which means the party that's being thrown that he's not even at is being thrown on his tab. He's the one paying for it. He doesn't care about the redemption of his younger brother. He cares about how what's happening isn't fair. He's upset he's being taken advantage of. We read in verse 28, the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. 
And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate him by killing the fattened calf. This story is actually talking about two wayward sons. This brother never left, but he's living in the far country too. See, far country isn't a reference to distance at all. It's a reference to the distance of our heart from the heart of God. Wherever you are not in fellowship with God, you are living your life in far country. So forget this message is about family hurt for a moment. And remember that we're all meant to be a spiritual family. We're all meant to love one another, to love your neighbor as yourself, to be in relationship with other human beings. How often in your life, when people have hurt you, when they've let you down, do you find yourself in a place where you are failing to see them with the eyes of the Father? And instead, you have the heart of the elder brother. I'm afraid for a lot of Christians, we've been, we've been saved so long, we've forgotten what it feels like to be lost, and we've forgotten how we needed someone in our lives who cared enough about our lostness to fight for us, to run to us. I love the words of John Ortberg on this topic. He said, one of the hardest things in the world is to stop being the prodigal son without turning into the elder brother. Now, side note on these two brothers. When you think of the seven deadly sins, four are sins of the mind, three are sins of the flesh. The younger brother was a prisoner to the sins of the flesh, lust, gluttony, and sloth. But the elder brother was captive to the sins of the mind, of the spirit, pride, covetousness, envy, and anger. And both sons revolted against the father. Both were chasing their own way above all else. But the emphasis of the story isn't on them. The true emphasis of the story is on the heart of the father. And that brings us to our part in resolving family hurt. If you've been hurt by your kids or by loved ones in your life, by friends, and you've had to fight that natural urge to withdraw emotionally, to protect your heart so you don't get angry, so you don't lash out. Listen, the ultimate goal in all we do is to have the heart of the father towards the things of this world. So when you take that truth and you apply it to parenting, you realize something. Here's what you realize. God relates to me as his child with love and forgiveness. I must offer the same to my children, to my friends, to my coworkers. This parable doesn't teach the right way to discipline our children because as important as that issue is, it's not God's top priority. While we are definitely called upon to train up our children in his ways, it's easy, isn't it, to end up heavy on the discipline and light on the grace? And yet God's love and grace are the greatest motivation for obedience. So what posture should we take in resolving family hurt? Number one, embrace pain as part of the process. Listen, every parent has expectations for their kids. Every parent wants their kids to embrace their values. Every Christian parent wants their kids to know Jesus. And yet we know it doesn't always go as planned, does it? We claim that you know, verse from Proverbs 22, verse six as a verse for our kids. Direct your children onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. And what we don't understand is this is not a promise your kids will be perfect because the Proverbs are not promises. They are general principles of wisdom. Generally, if you train your kids to be on the right path, they are much more likely to choose that path. But listen, every parent knows, at least to some extent, that in parenting, you will experience some rejection, some guilt, some frustration. The father experienced rejection of his heritage, rejection of their values, even rejection of himself and the value of his life by his own son. Not to mention the humiliation in the community when his son left and everyone knew what that meant and what that was going on in that family. Listen, you can be the most godly parent there's ever been and yet at times your kids are going to break your heart. And in seasons they may turn away and in seasons they may wander and as parents, our job is to discipline our kids, to train them, but we don't get to punish them for our pain. We don't get to punish them for our pain when they're not responding the way we want them to. Andy Stanley, uh, for years, has said that you should parent in a way that our kids want to come home even when they don't have to. And that's the goal with all kids, especially those who wander. Are we a safe place for our kids to return? And that starts with actually embracing pain as part of the parenting process. 
And that actually leads to the second thought. Always be ready to forgive. Or let me say that a little differently. Don't ever give up on anyone. To bring us full circle today, the lost always deserve to be found. The prodigals are always worth forgiving. See, the father let his son go, but he did not reject him. Loving your kids well requires you to relinquish control as they grow, even to the point of letting them make the wrong choices. Our kids will learn about God's grace from us and based on the level of grace we extend to them. So I want you to think about the moment, if, you're, if you've been saved, if you put your faith in Jesus, I want you to think about the moment that you were saved by Jesus, the moment you came to your senses, if you will. The Father has lavished his love on you and offered you far more grace, far more mercy than you deserve. And regardless of how far you wandered, your heavenly father always made it safe to come home. So much so that author Tim Keller referred to him as prodigal God, one who lavishes and extravagantly loves us. Some may even say to the point of foolishness in the eyes of men, but the wisdom of God does often seem like foolishness to us. My question is, do we demonstrate that kind of love to our prodigals? Whether we're talking about parents and our actual kids or whether we're talking about the family of God, people who have hurt us, those in our lives who have hurt us deeply, who have rejected us, who have created family hurt, resolving hurt starts with letting go of control, with trusting our Heavenly Father, with the souls of the wanderers, and with making sure it's always safe to come home. So we're gonna end this parenting series with prayer, and maybe you're here or or watching online, and, and your family is in a rough spot, and what you need right now, more than anything, is just to circle up where you are as a family and pray for God to help you get on the same journey. And I wanna encourage you to just circle up right now where you are, parents, to pray for your families, to pray for your kids, to confess where you messed up as parents, to repent and to start the journey over. Maybe your family is here or together watching, but your prodigal members are not. For those who are here, who are watching, I want you to join together with those who are here and intercede again for those you've maybe given up on. If you wanna get up, if you're here physically and you wanna get up and you wanna grab a pastor, we'd love to come and pray over your family. Maybe you're here or you're watching online and you're the prodigal, you're the wanderer. You've been looking for a home, a place to call home, a safe place, a place you can come back to. I want you to know Ransom Church is safe. You can come home. And more importantly, Jesus is safe. He's waiting, he loves you, he's longing to run to you, he's longing to throw his arms around you. And if that's you, and you wanna come up to the altar or you wanna write something in the chat online so that someone can reach out to you, if you're here, we'll have pastors, we'll have people at the altar to pray with you. This time, over this next few songs, is about healing. And as we wrap up this series, our goal is for health and healing for your family. In these next few moments, We want to challenge you. Take a step in getting there.